to fly any airplane, you have to deal with three basic problems. You have to have some way to get the airplane to create a vertical force that gets it off the ground. And we call this vertical force lift. You have to have a power source that will give you uh, the lift in a sense of uh, pushing it through the air in some way or other. And ultimately, we have to control it. We have to be able to keep it stable and we have to be able to point it in the direction we want. We have to take off and land safely. And these are three factors that apply to practically every plane that has ever been built or will be built. Now, in an aircraft, you have four basic forces which you will deal with at all times. You have lift and weight. We talked about the lift being that force that would get you off the ground. Weight, of course, is just simply the force of gravity on the airplane, which is always there. If you're flying a double flight, the lift and the weight forces are equal. There's always going to be aerodynamic drag on anything passing through an air, a fluid like air. And so you have to offset that with a thrust force and you must also add thrust that will act, cause the lift effect to work. So these are the four things that uh, deal in every airplane. Now in the last video, I talked about lift in more specific terms. You can see here in a wind tunnel image where the streamlines, especially those closest to the top of the wing, are more aggressively curved <clears throat> than the ones below. And this implies that the pressure uh, in that area above the wing is lower uh, than it is uh, below the wing where the wind, where the streamlines are less curved. And this, of course, creates a difference in pressure, which allows for uh, a lift effect to occur. But you do notice that the air um, is deflected downward. I also draw your attention to the right side of the image, noticing how it gets cloudy. And this is, of course, turbulence, where the air is no longer flying or flowing in a column, uh, columnic way. Another problem we face also with wings is when the air spills off the edge of the wing. If the underside of the wing is higher pressure than the top, then the air is going to snap from the bottom onto the top of the wing. And this creates a vortex, which can be fairly aggressive. And of course, that's work, doing work on the air. Uh, and thus, uh, that's wasting energy that can be used either in savings or to make the plane uh, perform more effectively. So these wing tip vortices are also known as induced drag. So if you may uh, consult the lecture I gave on aerodynamics, uh, induced drag is talked about at some length. The airplane um, also has have a, a um, and this is, uh, has to have control systems that allow us to uh, control it in the way we want to. Now, importantly, you can see the two green tabs here uh, marked A. Those are the ailerons, which I mentioned in my last video, and they are opposite uh, counter to each other. So if one, a goes, if one goes up, the other one will go down. And this will cause the banking effect, which causes an airplane to turn. At the back, you have the elevators, and they work in concert. And so they'll either both tip up or both tip down, and this will tend to raise or lower the airplane's nose. And finally, D, the rudder, okay will maintain the airplane's orientation uh, on its z-axis uh, versus the uh, direction of flight and none of these are going to actually change the plane you have to use the effects i talked about in my lecture on lit on, on sorry on banking i mentioned also in the last lecture about changing the geometry of the wing to make the airplane safer to land now here you see the leading edge slots deployed along with the flaps down and you can see the wing now is much more of a scoop effect. This is going to deflect air downward far more aggressively. Uh, this is going to create a lot of drag, uh, but that's okay because you're coming in for a landing uh, and you want to go nice and slow so that everything is controllable. And these features are on almost all uh, aircraft of any size um, uh, today, certainly big passenger planes anyway. Uh, this image here is taken from the back of a wing from inside as it's landing. Uh, you see the flaps are down. You'll see the aileron at the end of the wing is basically straight and level, which is what you do want to be banking when you're close to the ground. And these other surfaces are tipped up right now. Uh, those are called spoilers. So when you get on the ground, you want to stop the airplane uh, in a reasonable distance. But you also want to do it in a way that is the least uh, wearing on the airplane. Uh, if you're using your brakes all the time, 
then of course you're going to wear them out and that costs money and maintenance and so on. So these things tip up and it destroys the flow of air over the wing, which uh, will give you a drag effect and also help push the airplane down on the runway because the lift vector is effectively destroyed. Another thing that happens is that the airplanes, jet engines especially, will operate uh, in a uh, where they thrust deflectors, push the um, thrust of the engine uh, to the side and, and to some extent forward. Uh, and this also works as a very effective braking mechanism. In large propeller planes, they can reverse the pitch of the propellers, uh, but that's uh, not as common, but it does, it does exist. And these uh, thrust buckets, if you will, have there's different modes of how they do it. Uh, this is ones where the gates come across and close on the back of the engine. Sometimes you have others where the nacelle slides back, as they often do in bigger airplanes. All this started uh, over 100 years ago by various people, but the people credited with flying the first airplane are the two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, namely Wilbur and Orville Wright. Uh, I will post another video with a little more detail about their situation. But the main point here is that when they got interested in the flight discussion, uh, they found that the basic research, when they actually built a, a wing uh, the way that the, they'd been told to, it didn't perform very well. And uh, so they decided that the research that they had been reading about wasn't really very accurate. And so they went about building their own uh, wind tunnel and figuring it out themselves. at 8 Hawthorne Street in Dayton, Ohio, and with their uh, siblings, originally their mother who later passed away due to typhoid, and for many years with their father, and uh, who was a, um, a bishop in an um, obscure religious uh, sect called the United Brethren of Christ. Nevertheless, it was an interesting household. Uh, he wanted his boys to learn and got them, he didn't mind if they missed school a little bit, if they were out doing something useful. And I think it was a very fertile environment. And while Wilbur was older than Orville, by the time things settled down, they became quite a pair. Uh, here is a recreation of the back area of their bicycle shop, uh, as it sits right now uh, in Deer, uh, the uh, Greenfield Village uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, part of the Henry Ford Museum. The, it's the actual uh, bicycle shop was taken apart and brought up there, uh, and apparently uh, Charlie Taylor came up and made sure, and also Orville Wright, uh, that this was set up the way things looked. I'm sure there's it's cleaner than it was in those days, but the item in the front is what you need to see here, and that is, of course, their own homemade wind tunnel, and yes, that is a galvanized steel wash tub that directed the air into it. From their research, they built uh, gliders first to try to understand lift, and they had to go to a place that was windy to try to get a sense of what was going on in downtown Dayton or just outside of Dayton, certainly in the summertime uh, with the hot humid conditions is in comparison often not very windy at all. And so they went to the Kill Devil Hills uh, out in the Outer Banks of North Carolina and here the much uh, more effective wind. In the following image, you're going to see an example of gliders Well, first the glider is supported in a uh, fairly heavy wind by the two of them, and it is giving some lift, but not very much. And then the other airfoil, one that they built with their own research, is flying much more efficiently uh, with a smaller wing area uh, and apparently in a far less uh, aggressive wind. So again, they began to approach this problem scientifically compared to people before who did a lot of guessing. Getting a sense of how lift was generated with some efficiency, the next step for them was to deal with control. There's no point in putting an engine or a power source on it if the plane cannot be controlled. The brothers got the idea of twisting the wings, as you can see here, this cantilever effect. Uh, and in effect, this is going to cause one wing to drop when, and they're going inventing the bank, which allows the wings to force the airplane around the corner. But most importantly, it's going to allow for turns to be controlled. So in 1902, uh, I believe with Wilbur at the controls, they launched off the big hill 
uh, off of and the Kill Devil Hills. You can see it there today. And he made a turn, uh, a controlled turn, and this had not been done before. Uh, you notice how desolate this feature is. Of course, if you go there today, there's trees everywhere. Further north, there's uh, settlements and shopping malls and so on. Um, but even in this site here, there's a lot of vegetation now that did not exist when they were there. But nevertheless, this initial issue of first figuring out lift and then figuring out how to control uh, the actual flight of the gliders was really important. Now you could still have a gust of wind and they were certainly learning how to fly and they still had accidents. And apparently uh, around one of these times there was an accident and Wilbur Wright said, man will never fly for a thousand years. This man is Charlie Taylor. He was he worked in the uh, bicycle shop for the Wright brothers. I was one of their uh, mechanics and machinists. And so the task of building the first airplane engine fell to him. Uh, Wilbur had built a one cylinder uh, gas engine to run the machinery in the shop to drive the spindle in the ceiling. And that was not going to be enough for this. And so Taylor decided to build a uh, in this case, a three, I think it was a four cylinder engine. Uh, and of course it was broken on the first flight. So it's only pieces of it left. But Taylor, nevertheless, um, you have to deal with, there's no carburetor, there's no spark plugs, there's no fuel pump. Uh, all of the features that you might think are necessary are absent. Uh, it spit fuel back in the face of the pilot and, and uh, in Taylor's own words, and weren't much of an engine. Uh, I think it's more fair to characterize it as a bomb if you didn't ran it for too long, it would explode. It would overheat. Um, so this was as often as the case when we're doing something for the first time, we're getting a situation where we're right on the edge of what's possible. Nevertheless, with the strong headwinds that they were able to generate on the 17th of December, 1903, the Wright brothers decided to give an attempt. Samuel Langley had crashed a day or two before and they knew it was their turn. And so they had a rail you can see running all across the image that allowed the plane to move along the sand without friction. They tossed the coin, uh, Orville's at the controls, Wilbur's running alongside to steady the wing. There's a camera and they asked one of the lifeguards to squeeze the bulb uh, if, if anything happened. Of course, if it didn't pick up, when it ran off the rail, it would just run into the sand. And, uh, but uh, Orville was able to lift it off the ground and it flew, I believe, 108 feet uh, before landing in the sand. They flew three more times that day, the longest one being 850 feet, which Wilbur flew. They took turns. Uh, and for the first time in history, uh, we had the beginnings of mechanical flight. The next summer, the brothers came home and began to fly around a local field called Huffman Prairie with a, a, a better plane. Uh, they had to use a dropping system a dropping weight to give them enough speed to get off the ground, kind of like a catapult because of the low wind speeds. But they got up to the point where they could fly for almost a half an hour. And so then they decided to try to market their uh, invention and approached the United States government. Needless to say, the Army did not see the point of flight at all and how it would even be of any use. Uh, but there was lots of demonstrations, and of course, if you do enough of this, you're going to have a bad day. And that occurred uh, in, the, in the late 1900s uh, near Fort Myer, uh, just south of Washington, D.C. Uh, the propeller broke on the plane, and uh, Orville uh, was at the controls. Wilbur was in uh, France, uh, in Europe at least, uh, trying to market planes over there. And another young man who worked... Uh, uh, hard, sort of, I guess you could extend to say by for uh, for Glenn Curtis, who was also working for Alexander Graham Bell at one time. Uh, anyhow, he was with them, and so uh, Thomas Selfridge uh, died in this crash. Uh, Wilbur, um, sorry, Orville had um, broken bones and had took time to convalesce, but Selfridge uh, suffered a fatal injury, and there he is here, the first person in history to die. The catapult system, they used horses to raise it and it would drop this weight inside this tripod and that would get the plane uh, moving uh, rapidly enough to pick up in the air. And so they flew in uh, uh, 1904 and 5 and ultimately they stopped flying. 
and went to market their invention. Uh, it was clear they knew what they were doing and that they had uh, figured it out well enough. Uh, later on, uh, they trained pilots here. Um, famously, one of the generals of World War II, Hap Arnold, so General of the Air Force, uh, was trained by Orville Wright himself. And, uh, but in 1912, uh, Wilbur Wright uh, got uh, typhoid and he died. And Orville did not have the heart in the same way to continue. And within a year or two, decided to sell the company and he became uh, a gentleman. And uh, this is the tragedy of these things. We uh, think today that the safe water is, is a given, but of course we did not have uh, chlorination in the water systems until the 1920s in most places. And this was a problem. When they were out on the Outer Banks, Orville, sorry, Wilbur would talk to the lifeguard uh, people and have them boil a water they used for about 20 minutes to make sure that there was no pathogens because it had killed their mother, so he was very concerned about it. Because the American uh, Army Air Forces would not, were no interest in airplanes, the airplanes that flew in World War I were largely French airplanes. You can see here uh, one of the most famous ones of the war, the SOP with Camel. This has a, an engine in the white area at the front where the pistons are in a radial pattern around the center. These are called radial engines. Uh, what's nice about them is that they are uh, easy to mount and of course they do not require a liquid cooling system as the air rushing past is adequate. The a machine gun would be mounted on top of the engine and would be timed to shoot uh, through uh, without hitting the propeller blade proper. You can see very much the biplane aspect but you can also see the maturity if you will in the 10 years between when the airplanes uh, first flew and the maturation of uh, it here in World War One. Here's a triplane uh, that was experimented with to increase wing area and increase lift perhaps with wings that are a little less efficient. Uh, most of them didn't fly particularly well uh, but the most famous one of course was flown by the uh, highest ranking ace uh, in World War I, Baron Manfred von Richthofen, uh, the Red Baron in shorter language, who may well have been brought down by ground fire their aviator. Here you see a radial engine exposed and all those lines along the piston wall of course increases the surface area which improves the cooling. But again, you can see how simple this engine is, and these were used extensively right off, up until and after World War II uh, because of their simplicity and their, and their ability to take. Um, you can, um, they can be damaged, uh, and they were made stronger. You could put concentra uh, sorry, subsequent uh, rings of pistons and make up to uh, a much larger engine, and this was certainly done uh, over a number of different types uh, in World War II. I believe one of the largest ones, I think, was 28 pistons. Most famous of the time was an American uh, named Charles Lindbergh, and he helped design this airplane called the Spirit of St. Louis, as so built by the Ryan Company in California. He flew it across the United States with the idea of flying uh, solo from the uh, New York area all the way to France, New York to Paris. Um, people had perished doing this, uh, the amount of gasoline you'd have to take and how, um, how safe the plane would be and whether it would make it and whether it would break and all those things were a very great concern. He barely got off the ground given the weight of the plane at the time and then 34 odd hours later landed in Paris to enormous adulation. The president sent a ship to be, bring him back home again. And you, the, French, uh, the French people had always been very interested in aviation proper. And so there was profound interest in the uh, exploit. And so when Lindbergh came home, of course, you have one of the biggest ticker tape parades in New York history. Uh, and, and all the rest people would talk about the Lindbergh parade in New York City even in the 1960s, so 40 odd years later. Uh, and when Lindbergh came home, then he began to fly around the country and show his plane to um, other people uh, and to publicize and promote uh, flying. And so they would arrive in different towns uh, all across the country and people would gather to see the famous plane. Uh, 
And uh, this leads, in some respects, to a little bit of a story uh, of my own, and uh, we'll pick that up in a minute. Uh, is this this picture here is that of my grandparents uh, who lived north of Toronto uh, my grandfather was a farmer so it's nothing much to do perhaps with aviation except that for their wedding uh, honeymoon they decided to take a motor trip as it was called in those days and they went to Detroit Michigan to see Lindbergh's plane and that must have been quite an exciting thing uh, the story goes that my grandmother is told that uh, they got a chance to get right up to the airplane and see inside it in a way that the average person did not. And they were kind of wondering why that was, and they figured out later that my grandfather had been mistaken for Charles Lindbergh and no police officer was going to st stand in the way just in case uh, it was the great man. So this is kind of a nice little personal story. In the wars, the governments did not spend a great deal of money on the development of airplanes, and while there were some improvements, we were still seeing a fair amount of biplane action even into the 1930s, primarily because of the engine inabilities. Uh, and uh, also, you can see this plane here because of the way it's constructed, it still has a lot of fabric on it as well. And um, But the 1930s, of course, led to the rise of Hitler and the fears that many people had that that military action may well soon come. And this was felt probably most strongly in England. And during the 1930s, the British uh, began to design some newer equipment to counter what was clearly out there. This is the uh, BF-109, uh, mistakenly sometimes called the Messerschmitt 109, which was one of the primary fighter planes or pursuit planes that the Germans had in World War II. And, uh, these planes were used in the Spanish Civil War by the Germans, if you will, for practice purposes. And so it was clear to many people uh, how much more modern the British, uh, rather the German situation had become, and that they better do something about it. And these low-wing metal monoplanes with big, you know, V-12 engines in them uh, was something that really had to be countered. On the other side of the world, the Japanese had come up with this plane, the Mitsubishi A6M0. You see the engine's exhaust going around the, in the concentric uh, around the nose. This is a radial engine plane. It was noted for its speed and its maneuverability. Uh, the reason that that was primarily the reason, uh, the back of it was is that uh, this plane had no almost no armor at all and was very little protection for the pilot. So they gave up a lot of weight to to have this maneuverability and that worked for a while but when the allied aircraft became uh, better and stronger uh, these planes were in comparison fairly easy to bring down because their fuel tanks would explode or the pilot could become injured very quickly perhaps one of the most famous planes of the war was the supermarine spitfire with its elliptical wing which tended to reduce induced drag and that magnificent rolls-royce merlin engine which was used extensively on many uh, British planes, of course, as well as even some American ones during World War II. Uh, both the measures, the BF-109 and the Spitfire were modified heavily during the war with the engines probably gaining, maybe not quite double, but pretty close to it uh, over, the, over the war. So planes in 1944-45 uh, were far more capable than the planes of 1940, for example. They might look very similar but the, the true capabilities uh, were quite different. One of the biggest challenges was dealing with altitude uh, and supercharging engines and all this kind of thing. Uh, this is the um, uh, Falker Wolf 190, which was a later uh, addition to the German uh, fighter planes. It was considered perhaps more maneuverable and more dangerous than the 109. And uh, this was some real trouble for uh, many allied pilots. The German pilots, of course, especially when the war began to go bad for them, they flew every day, uh, and basically until they died. And so some of them mounted some very, very significant uh, tallies of, bring, of Allied fighters, where on the other hand, a lot of cases, at least in the beginning, the Allied pilots had very little training and often uh, were brought down quite easily. 
the large bomber missions into Europe during World War II, uh, originally they tried to fly them straight in without escorts and using simply just guns on the planes. And in many cases, they were shot out of the skies. And it became clear that they had to have an escort uh, fighter plane to hold the uh, enemy fighter planes, the German planes, away. And this was worked on and ultimately by 1944, uh, it was built by the North American Aviation Corporation and it's known as the P-51 Mustang. Uh, and they used a Merlin engine in this American airframe. Uh, it was built by Studebaker uh, under contract in the United States. Now, the thing that we have to remember is the strategies before World War II began was, it was all about the big, as we call capital ships. Battleships, dreadnoughts, with their massive gun power, the 16-inch diameter guns uh, that could lava shell 20 miles or so uh, to great effect. And uh, they were the, uh, the place that uh, er the ships that everybody felt were going to be the deciding factor. However, it was shown to be faulty very quickly in the war. Uh, in 1941, first uh, the, um, the Bismarck, a German battleship, was sank. Uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, and it was disabled by little biplanes, swordfish biplanes off of one of the British carriers. Uh, there's the Bismarck uh, in this image here, and uh, there was only 112 or so survivors out of a crew of almost 2,000. It was a pretty tragic business. However, uh, no matter how strong these ships were built, uh, the inability to resist the effects of air-dropped bombs and torpedoes uh, meant that they had passed their time. Uh, later that year in uh, the Pacific, the battleship Prince of Wales was sank, and it was a brand new ship uh, by Japanese planes. And the Japanese also had large battleships uh, during World War II, all of which uh, were sank by Allied uh, airplanes off of the carriers. Now you see here the Swordfish biplane, which was able to cripple the, the Bismarck, uh, it seems obtuse that this was the case, uh, but that is the way the technology uh, moves ahead. And so there was a big set of uh, changing of strategy and uh, careers were made and lost uh, as uh, the aircraft carrier uh, became the primary projection of force. The notion of putting airplanes on ships started in the 1920s. This is the Langley. Uh, and um, ultimately, of course, uh, the aircraft carrier uh, became uh, a far more sophisticated uh, with the way they built them. But in World War II, uh, the aircraft carriers weren't all that much different than the Langley. The primary difference was that you'd have a, uh, a tower to control the airplanes, sort of like a control tower at an airport. Uh, and the airplanes were much more high performance uh, traveling. And so we had to deal with ways to try and stop the airplane uh, on the deck after it landed. And as you'll see that in a few minutes. So the aircraft carrier began to improve. Uh, it became a, a more a purpose-built ship instead of a, some other kind of a ship with just a deck put on top of it. Uh, and uh, these were, this is example here is a typical aircraft carrier from World War II. Uh, but of course, um, their effectiveness in the Japanese war, primarily, uh, and even to some extent in the Atlantic Ocean, but primarily in the Pacific, uh, realized that the uh, United States being the eminent superpower at the end of the war, uh, the aircraft carriers certainly were part of their future. And this continued to be the case. And in the 1960s, the United States moved ahead with the next generation you can see the angled deck here, so you're landing uh, planes and taking off planes at the same time. Uh, this is the United States Enterprise CVN, I believe, 65. It's the first ever nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carrier, and that's uh, spelled out by men standing on the deck, as you see there. The airplanes are catapulted off the front of the carrier by steam catapults from the reactor steam. And when they land, they will catch a cable uh, that will then stop the plane because when you land you immediately go to uh, military power because if you don't catch the cable you're going to fall off the front end of the carrier. Aircraft carrier is about a thousand feet long. Most runways of, at airports are five or six thousand feet long or even longer. 
Here's the catapult in operation here. You can see the airplane at full afterburner going off the front and the steam effect as it flings it from zero to about 200 miles an hour in about two to 300 feet. Uh, that panel that is up in the air is to prevent the plane behind it from getting scorched by the jet blast. So these uh, catapults were uh, very important. You can see to the right of the catapult, there's a lower area there, which is where the men work who are um, running this system, as well as there is also an inset in the deck uh, in the left center where one of the uh, controllers works there. And of course, there's crew on the deck as well, putting, uh, securing catapults and doing other jobs. This is a very prescriptive place and the deck of an aircraft carrier is a very dangerous place. Here's an aircraft landing um, and catching the cable, which is what we call an arresting cable. Uh, the hook on the plane is dropped, it's called a tail hook. You'll also notice that the airplane's landing gear is extremely robust because when they come down on, an, on a carrier, which is also tossing in the seas, it's a controlled crash. So Navy planes have to have a much uh, more aggressive landing gear system to prevent them from being damaged um, as they come down. And so um, this allows the United States Navy uh, to uh, project force around the world, right or wrong, uh, that we're not dealing with the politics here, this is the technology we're talking about here. So the next version of this is going to be, this is what we call the Nimitz class carrier, which is uh, slowly being replaced now by the, the next version, the Ford class. Um, but you see here the angled deck and it's a little bit bigger boat. Uh, what you don't see, of course, is the electronics and all of the uh, high-end technology that's underneath the deck, if you will, to make sure that things operate. There are elevators to lower the planes down. Underneath the flight deck is a huge maintenance facility, which also allows for uh, maintaining the aircraft. And the complement on most air carriers would be in the neighborhood of about 70 to 80 planes. So it is a very significant uh, vehicle. Uh, about 5,000 uh, people. We're moving back to airplanes for a moment, uh, in World War II you see a lot of innovation. Uh, one of the things was to try and stop the bombing raids over Germany. Uh, the Germans would fly uh, these, uh, what, this particular case is a, a Messerschmitt 110, uh, and they would have a uh, antenna system on the front that would help find the bombers in the nighttime using an, an effectively some uh, version of radar. Uh, the biggest challenge, of course, when radars first invented was to get the uh, wavelength of the radar down to centimeters from meters and tens of meters, allowing the device to be put inside an airplane. Uh, and this also led to the destruction of the U-boats because they could find U-boats from the air as well. One of the more remarkable planes of World War II was the first operational jet fighter, first flown in 1943. This is the Messerschmitt 262 Swallow. It had two Ju. 004 jet engines in it, and every time it flew, it pretty much broke the previous airspeed record. Uh, it had rockets on the wings, and it had a very aggressive four cannons in the nose. I had this plane flown earlier <clears throat> in the war in significant numbers, it may well have changed the ability of the Allies to bomb Germany. It was a very fine airplane. Uh, the one issue was the front landing gear was kind of weak. Um, and they had to be careful how they towed it around. Uh, the other thing in this type of airplane is you could only advance the throttles very carefully. Uh, after World War II, the jet became the fighter uh, pursuit plane of choice very, very quickly. Uh, the war in Korea began only five years later and it was basically an entirely a jet war. Uh, this is uh, a version of the F-86 Sabre jet, which was flown by the United States against the MiG-15s. Uh, basically, you have a jet that goes right through the center of the airplane uh, and uh, uh, flies, you know, pretty close to the speed of sound. So uh, this was the evolution, if you will. And you can see from, you know, mid-30s to 1950s, only 15 years, you go from biplanes to jets. And it just shows the remarkable innovation during World War II. If we look at heavy aircraft for a moment, this is uh, the Hanley Page uh, bomber, I suppose you could call it, in World War I, a huge unwieldy airplane. Uh, you have all kinds of challenges with a large plane like this. You can see the trusses holding the wings from crapping, cracking and so forth. You also see the, uh, the, the landing gear uh, rubber and uh, its uh, type of uh, chemistry in those. This was very, uh, very new and the tires could not be made uh, very large without failing. 
so there was um, it was very difficult really in the beginning to make large airplanes and that's really extended if in many ways right up until uh, into well into World War II. Uh, there was um, beginnings in the 1920s of commercial aviation. Uh, this is the Ford Trimotor which is pretty much the only time the Ford company ever built an airplane. Uh, but there were um, other ones that began to fly uh, at that time. And so there was limited amount of air travel, generally by the wealthy or by people who worked for various companies. Uh, and um, there was, uh, again, the challenge, as I said in my previous lecture, is the engines. Here you have three engines all doing the best they can. To, to pull what is in many ways not that big an airplane into the air. Uh, you'll see here now the Junkers 52 uh, transport plane, uh, which had the, basically the same uh, principle. Uh, this plane uh, was used uh, by Lufthansa for transport and then ultimately extensively in World War II. But one of the problems, of course, is these planes fly fairly slowly, uh, and this made them um, very vulnerable to the um, uh, Allied fighter uh, patrols. The Blitz, the Germans never really had a heavy bomber and they flew these, among other planes, the uh, Heinkels and so on, these Dornier 17s, which had very narrow fuselages and from altitude they were called flying pencils. And the, the, the bomb load was fairly small from these planes, but still uh, adequate uh, to create a fair amount of damage not only in the dock area of London and so forth, but also in some of the cities um, in the countryside as well uh, out, uh, during the war. Um, the Germans uh, did not build a heavy bomber. If you really think about it, it at the time, it would have been hard to decide why to do so. But also, again, uh, aviation was also pretty new. On the other hand, the Allies knew that they had to operate from England, and if they were going to act on the German industry, they had to fly a fair distance, seven, eight hundred miles, in some respects even further, and they needed a, a big, heavy, uh, four-engine type airplane that would do it. And this is the Boeing B-17, which is the primary bomber for the Americans during World War II. The British, of course, used the Lancaster uh, and uh, the Halifax, among others. Uh, this plane had uh, guns on the nose, on the top, underneath, at the back, and so on, which is still not enough to protect it uh, when the Luftwaffe fighters were around. In the Pacific, the distances were even further, and Boeing built the Boeing B-29, which is the first pressurized bomber, uh, and it had um, remote control, well, if you will, the turrets, and so forth, but its main um, way of staying alive was to fly high enough that uh, the Japanese planes couldn't get there. Um, however, the winds around Japan were so uh, swirling and so aggressive that the bombs would get blown off course. And so they had to change their strategy. Uh, and this was the same uh, airplane that ultimately dropped. Uh, this type of airplane was the one that dropped the two um, nuclear weapons on Japan. Uh, after the war, you have even bigger planes because now nuclear weapons are the big factor. And um, the Americans, of course, invented them. But within four years, partly due to their own capabilities, also due to espionage, the Soviet Union now set off their first nuclear weapon. And this put uh, started something called the Cold War, which went on for the next 40 years. One side trying to outdo the other one. This was an enormous airplane called the Boeing, um, sorry, the Convair B-36 Peacemaker. Uh, it had uh, six enormous propeller engines, uh, where, the, uh, where they were pusher engines, where the propellers were on the back, and also jets on the wings. Uh, but it was slow, and when the missiles and so forth started to show up, uh, those planes were later then replaced by jet planes. This is the B-47 Stratojet, which was, uh, although it's not as big by any means as the Peacemaker, uh, it could at least um, had a chance to, to move a little faster and be more effective. Uh, but the problem was using bombers was really starting to become passe because you had 
uh, the ability of missiles to travel unbelievably fast and to bring down uh, these types of airplanes. And this led to a reconsideration. And this is an example. This uh, plane here, the B-58 Hustler, which was traveling, could travel probably Mach 3, is an enormously uh, powerful airplane. Um, but the problem was by the time it was actually flying, uh, a missile could bring it down and it really had a very limited uh, service life because of the challenges. And this is the whole thing. If you would go back to the battleship uh, admirals of World War II, who very soon found that the, the platform that they had trained their whole life to operate in <clears throat> was, was already obsolete. Uh, and of course, if you're going to operate an aircraft carrier, it's a totally different philosophy. And the same thing happened here where you were a bomber pilot and suddenly now you can't fly at high altitude anymore. It's too vulnerable. Uh, and the last gasp of this was at the turn of the 60s, which is the XB-70, is a Mach 3 bomber. And the idea here was to have the airplane fly so fast that it would stay away from the, the Soviet fighters. But regardless, it's not going to avoid a missile. And at the same time, this plane was unbelievably expensive. So as the Kennedy administration took over, uh, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara canceled this. And so there were two of these planes left. One crashed in an accident uh, as research planes. And uh, so, but the anti-aircraft missile that was directed by heat seeking for the engines or radar controlled, these came out in the late 50s, early 60s and completely changed the philosophy because if you're going to now uh, attack you're going to be doing it from the ground you're going to be landing flying very very low uh, completely the opposite of how you would ever fly in the past and this was the change the technologies and resetting this 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 trust and parry if you will between the superpowers cost each of the governments enormous sums of money as expensive projects for research would have to be canceled or scaled back in, in view of other ones as they went along. Uh, and that's that was the price of, uh, of being part of the team. So the next member of this club, so to speak, was this remarkable airplane, the B-1B. Um, this plane uh, flew, uh, when it was reinvented, flew very low. Uh, and could follow the terrain very, very nicely. It had some small stealth capability. It could also travel just over the, you know, around the speed of sound, but the point was is that it was a fairly big plane, had a fair amount of capability, and could fly very low and very, very uh, dependably so. So by the 1970s, the movement moved away again from the manned, uh, bomber type airplane. It is incredibly expensive and there's always the issue of the crews and bringing them home and so forth and uh, in favor of uh, these remote devices in this particular case called a cruise missile and so either they're in comparison uh, a small fraction of the cost of a bomber. However, uh, depending on the situation on the application, the situ uh, so you may still need to have vehicles with ordnance <clears throat> and this is manifested in many ways today by this aircraft the b-52 which was pioneered in the early 1950s and is still flying and may well have a service life of almost 100 years it is very vulnerable it is not a stealthy aircraft at all but it can carry uh, a fair amount of stuff and, and if properly deployed, can be still very useful. And in comparison to some of the other planes, is comparatively less expensive. So it is interesting. And all the stressors that, say, the United States Air Force has been put into as a superpower, having to change modes, change modes, change modes, and then finally the Soviet Union disappeared, and you got a totally different set of circumstances. And it's a, it would be fantastically expensive to maintain that. We move over to commercial aviation <clears throat> before uh, and into the, the beginning of the 1950s, but certainly before. This was the most successful airplane. It was the DC-3, uh, getting its start in the 1930s. <clears throat> and um, so a lot of B movies have these in them because they really were one of the workhorses that way. Some of them are still flying today. And uh, it was, you know, the first uh, airplane that had, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, a seat or two on each side and you could actually begin to move people around and and begin meaningful air travel a lot of course when those air travels being first pioneered uh, they didn't use 
there were no airports, and so airplanes landed on the water near, uh, and this is the extreme case of that, the uh, <clears throat> Boeing B-14 Pan Am uh, flying boat, the Clipper, um, and this is, uh, <clears throat> there weren't too many of these made, it's a very difficult airplane to fly, and of course as soon as airports got built, it was much more convenient to use the airports, and World War II also facilitated the uh, building of airports, initially perhaps for military purposes, <clears throat> but later for, um, uh, they were then adapted for civilian use. And so these are magnificent planes, but there wasn't that many of them built, but they were a stepping stone that opened up air routes in parts of, especially in South America and in the Orient and so forth. Inside, uh, these planes look very much just like a, a hotel, if you will, hard to imagine that you're actually on board an airplane and uh, we have to remember up until probably the late 1960s air travel was an elegant thing you, when you traveled you wore a shirt and tie the ladies wore dresses often wore gloves uh, you had a hat <clears throat> and you had a corsage and you were dressed you know properly so to speak for the na nature of the trip even in, <clears throat> my parents went to Europe in 1960 on the jet, you still were dressed up. You certainly weren't wearing, um, you know, loafers and a pair of short pants and a t-shirt. That was just un unthinkable in, in a more formal time. The flight deck of the Clipper was a large area. You had the pilots, but you also had the flight engineer uh, managing the engines. <clears throat> you had a navigator, and you can see the map table to the left. Uh, some of these would have sextants on board. You take star sightings, so you'd know where you are. It's long before GPS. And, of course, a radio operator. But these planes, when they flew over the ocean, were far more um, on their own, so to speak, than aircraft are today. And uh, so it was a whole different type of thing. I'm sure today a lot of us would think of it as pretty risky to just jump in and, and this propeller plane uh, where, you know, engines are known sometimes to be unreliable and uh, head off, you know, in some exotic location. After the war, <clears throat> the uh, propeller planes made their last stage before the jets arrived. And this is one of the more unique planes. It was, uh, not too many were built. <clears throat> it was uh, the Boeing 377, a Strato Cruiser. <clears throat> uh, American Overseas Airlines was, of course, the precursor for Pan Am. Uh, other uh, um, airlines flew them as well, including the British. Uh, and it was one of the more elegant planes. You had an upstairs and a downstairs. Uh, there was a, a bar downstairs, and you could go up and down the spiral staircase. There was Pullman-style bunks on board, but you could sleep. Uh, so um, I just find it one of the more remarkable planes. There's a very nice YouTube video about it if you want to have a look. Uh, here's the flight deck, and once again, the big greenhouse uh, cockpit uh, and the pilots uh, managing the systems and of course behind them and to the right would have been the flight engineer who would manage all the engines uh, you have four engines and an enormous number of, of parameters to maintain and it would certainly be well beyond the purview of a sim of a, of a pilot to do that um, today of course we're used to the cockpit having only two um, people on board um, that uh, is of course an innovation from the 1980s into the 90s when the glass cockpits and the computerization really began to take hold. Um, it was uh, certainly not possible in those years. <clears throat> the final gaff of the propeller plane was this one, is the DC-7. And these, uh, again, you you know, you may know the jets are coming, but you still have to fly in between. And so there's these stopgap planes. Some of them, after providing civilian service, now get used <clears throat> in other purposes. This one here... Uh, is uh, fighting forest fires, and the red you see underneath is a fire retardant chemical that's been spraying. And so these are all aspects of um, of how these planes, you know, made a contribution. And, and it all was part of this whole process. Um, you also have to remember, you know, with all weather flying, the difficulties of landing in, in fog and rain and so forth are so much easier than they used to be. So we move to the jet engine, and you can see this simplified view here. <clears throat> this is the type of jet engine that we see today. So if we ignore, look at the center tunnel, you see first the green um, blades. Uh, they're spinning rapidly, and the air comes in and gets compressed. 
uh, by those blades and then uh, high pressure of the second set of blades compresses even more so when they get to the center uh, you end up with a very high pressure and that's where the combustion occurs because there's high pressure in the, the left part then the uh, gases are forced out the right part and so they and while they on the way out they will spin the turbines uh, to drive the compressors at the front uh, and at the same time you get a thrust out the back and uh, the, uh, this is a view here of the original turbo jet, as they called them. So in this case, all the gases go in at the left and go through the compressor blades, through the combustion chamber, out the turbines at the back. In the case of the one you saw a minute ago, a good amount of the air goes around the entire case. We call this a high bypass turbofan. It's in effect a turbine that's not driving a propeller, but actually driving a fan. Uh, and these are very, very efficient. And we're going to see one of these again here in a bit more of a realistic view. Uh, what these do is they provide a much greater thrust and also these are quieter engines. So, and much better fuel usage as we begin to maximize these things. So here's a, an example of a high bypass turbo fan. So you can see the center part, the, the veins aren't as clear, which is why I used the other one. But you can see the high, a uh, big uh, fan at the front and most of the air goes past everything. Uh, and that, of course, will also help with the um, issue of the aircraft's noise, especially at takeoff and so forth near uh, runways and so forth. Now, turbines have been around a long time, uh, invented um, primarily at the end of the 1800s and uh, used primarily in uh, plants for boats, uh, big big motors, uh, power stations, and things like this. You see here coming up a power station turbine that's been open for uh, maintenance. The steam will be introduced at the center of the turbine and it will move outward. Uh, it's going to catch the uh, fan blades and they have little hooks on them. And this takes the steam pressure and converts it to rotational energy, which will spin the shaft, spin the generator. Now, all of these turbines that you see there are all connected to the same uh, shaft and so that uh, power station turbines are enormous in size and um, probably in the neighborhood of uh, um, a few hundred feet long in some cases depending exactly the the actual power of it and so forth and uh, so but normally these are meant for big things and so the turbofan engine you know its invention and, and perfection if you will in the last 50 years really makes a difference this was the um, de Havilland jetliner, something that isn't talked about a great deal. Uh, it was in, uh, built in Toronto here at the end, the end of the 1940s or 1950s. And it was a very successful plane and did not have the troubles that the uh, Comet did. However, just like the Arrow, the Canadian government decided that during the Korean War it was inappropriate to be building a jetliner, so they axed the project. But uh, it was a very close thing uh, of it being sold to Hughes Aircraft and this well could have been, uh, we could have had a very fine uh, aerospace industry here north of Toronto uh, had things been different. But uh, the, it's the decisions made at a time when sometimes the people don't see the new technologies. So here's the Boeing 707, <clears throat> uh, first fl flying commercially in service in 1958. Uh, and this, of course, is the uh, jetliner that changed everything um, along with the DC-8. Uh, but I think the Boeing 707 carried a little more um, traction. Uh, you could go from New York to London in five and a half hours <clears throat> and to the continent, you know, really uh, in, in half a day. It was truly com compared to the past where you were taking propeller planes and to stop a number of times for gas or boats that took days and days to get there compared to basically a few hours. Uh, and this was a real... Um, absolute change in how it was for people to either vacation or to go home and see family or to go home and, and give respects when someone passed away. This is the Douglas uh, and later McDonald Douglas DC-8 uh, that uh, was began to fly around the same time. These planes had similar values. It does look when you see the pictures that the Boeing Airplane seems to have a slightly larger interior diameter. Uh, in all honesty, they're very, very similar. Uh, both planes were three seats and a center aisle. Uh, but you have to understand when you travel in those days, there was no movies, no entertainment of any kind, no radio, no nothing. You sat there, you had two meals, and if you didn't read a book, you were bored out of your skull. Um, <clears throat> in 1968-69, Boeing built 
the Boeing 747, the first um, wide-body aircraft. Uh, uh, the um, <clears throat> Pan Am was the first one of the launch customers. And so we had a chance now to instead of taking 100 and say 185 people, now you're taking 400. Uh, two aisles, one of the first uh, 20 feet wide inside compared to 11. Just in a completely different situation. And this is the plane that opened up the world for the average tourist. You weren't wearing a shirt and tie anymore. You're getting on the plane wearing short pants and a t-shirt uh, and, and going off to wherever it was you were going to visit. Uh, and it is one of the most profoundly successful planes uh, and a, a tremendous follow-on to the 707. The initial cockpit of the 747 had almost 1,300 dials, gauges, and switches and was uh, and kept three pilots very busy uh, maintaining the aircraft in flight. Uh, the initial uh, inertial navigation systems were just being pioneered at the time, uh, but the Boeing 707's initial ones that went across the Atlantic in the early 60s had sextants on board. I don't know how much they were used uh, to take star sightings to verify aircraft location. These um, uh, analog cockpits that had all the dials and gauges and switches in them and so forth uh, persisted well into the 1980s. In fact, even Air Force One, the uh, presidential airplane, it has still got this configuration, although that will change. And then they moved to this type of configuration here on the, the more modern aircraft where you have the uh, screens, uh, the, the cathode ray tubes, the flight management system. You see uh, the throttles in the center, the knobs, and then on the left and the right, there's those two smaller consoles. Those are the flight management the, uh, system interfaces. And uh, today, of course, flying an airplane is a totally different experience for the pilots, and you can do the entire mission with just the two pilots. The engine management that was done before is now done by the computer. Uh, even uh, our electronic checklists, and if something fails, you get a checklist of what to do. Uh, it's truly amazing how far it's come. Uh, inside uh, the airplane, if you look, um, you can see different configurations depending on the airline. 343 is one configuration side, but the inside of these car, uh, car, uh, compartments is enormous, and it's just truly an amazing thing given where we started at the Wright Brothers. I always think of my grandfather who was born in 1903 and died in 1981, a 77-year life, and that span between the Wright Brothers, you know, wood and canvas plane and the launch of the first ever space shuttle. Uh, and that's just in 77 years. So the developments <clears throat> in the 20th century from the standpoint of, of this type of technology are just really um, mind-boggling. As airplanes became more efficient, you saw a movement away from the three, uh, the four-engine uh, jetliner to the three-engine jetliner, uh, and this was generally the L-1011, in this case the DC or DC-10, and later the DC MD-11. <clears throat> These planes uh, had one less engine. That's a lot of money, a lot less maintenance. So this was appealing. But the biggest issue is what do you do when you're traveling over these large water, and if something fails? power to get to a safe landing site. And this was the big question <clears throat> uh, with these types of planes. And this was seen as a stopgap to move from three, uh, four engines rather to three. Uh, in the early 1980s, uh, Boeing moved to the 767, <clears throat> which is the first wide body uh, airplane, which was only two engines. <clears throat> and we'd had lots of two engine planes before, but they were seen as regional airplane, you know, flying from New York to Washington or what have you. Uh, now we're looking at planes that are bigger and wider and they can make, uh, can fly a, a good distance, if not all the way across, say, Canada, for example. And the first example was the 6-7, which is largely retired now. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so, once again, you're trying to make the airplane cheaper and more efficient. I won't say cheaper, but more economical. You only have two engines instead of four, less maintenance, and so on, and more thrust. These engines are far more powerful than the original 707 tile engines are. Now, these planes are slightly smaller inside, and so the internal cockpit use situation you might see a 2-3-2 two, two arrangement, which isn't all that much bigger than the old-fashioned 6-3-3 uh, three, three arrangement. Uh, you see the in-flight entertainment systems on the back of all the chairs. This is something that started to show up in the late 1990s and into the, 20th, uh, the 21st century, but certainly did not exist in any way uh, before that. Uh, I remember flying in the 1980s, and you, would, you could maybe plug in and get a... Um, some music 
<clears throat> and uh, if there was a movie, there was a screen at the front that it was projected on. And if you wanted to watch the movie, you could turn a certain channel on your earphones and you would be able to hear it. Uh, um, <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, in the mid-1990s, uh, Boeing decided to try to build a bigger twin jet that could replace the 747. Uh, here you have uh, an aircraft with the two of the largest, the largest jet engines ever built for a commercial aircraft. Uh, the 777, as they call it, is as big a plane as the 747 in length and wingspan, plus or minus. But as you can see, it's operating with only two engines. <clears throat> it has a maximum takeoff weight that is slightly less than the 747, but not all that much, and a very significant range in this different modifications. The engines on this plane are, uh, the intakes are 11 feet in diameter, so that is big enough to accept the fuselage of a 707 <clears throat> to give you perspective on how much bigger. And here's an example of one of those engines of GE 90-115. It's 115,000 pounds of thrust compared to maybe 20,000 pounds of thrust on the original jet, turbojet engines from way back when. But just shows you with the technician standing beside it how incredibly large. I was at the airport once in a maintenance hangar, and those fan blades that you see on the left, they are curved. They're specially made out of a secret metal. They weigh about 45 pounds each. They're perfectly balanced, and they cost $175,000 each. Uh, this engine here, depending on the day, would be somewhere between twenty-five and $35 million US per engine. So then you can figure the exchange rate in there. So it, <clears throat> it, is, it really does matter to the airlines. You can see here, on uh, the 747, which already had high bypass turbofans, and they're testing one of the uh, 777 engines, and you can see how much bigger it is on top of what is already a big engine as it is. And uh, just as a, it's just an amazing thing to see. To try and prolong the 747, uh, airlines like KLM tried to uh, re-engine the 747 with only two of the 777's engines. Uh, it worked from the standpoint of thrust and performance, but the engines were seen to be too low to the runway in the danger of striking on landing. The uh, lead engineer at the beginning of the 777 project was this man, Alan Mulally, uh, who uh, later on uh, was vice president of Boeing and ultimately the president of the Ford Motor Company. Um, and I just have a lot of respect for how he uh, runs his uh, operations. Um, so that's why I include him in this little video here. Uh, Boeing moved on then to the 787 or the Dreamliner. This is one of the first planes where they're starting to use an extreme amount of carbon fiber on board the airplane. We have, again, high bypass turbofans, not as big as the ones on the 777, but big enough. And when you see the Dreamliner, you think of it kind of uh, like a 737, a, a regional jet, but it, it, this plane takes more people on board than, a, than the old uh, Boeing 707 does. This is a very significant sized airplane. And what the difference here is, is that you're getting an excellent fuel burn. Uh, and this is what really, that's one of the biggest expenses that airlines have. And, um, and so, and of course, the reliability. Uh, airplanes and many companies have to fly 14, 15 hours a day just to make uh, make money. This airplane is the uh, Airbus A340. This was uh, sort of a stopgap. You see the 777 and the beginning of the twin jet capability, something called ETOPS, extended twin uh, engine uh, operations, where you could fly uh, up to two, perhaps three hours away from a potential landing site. So that could allow you to cross larger expanses of ocean uh, with only two engines uh, and of course in the late 80s that was not that was still on the horizon so this plane airbus the french german consortium um, british consortium uh, built this plane with the four engines so that they could still get uh, and travel those routes um, so it was a partial success but it's now being removed from service so you can see the interior this was a two a four two arrangement um, but um, Airbus planes are extremely well put together, very, very well respected for their technical uh, acumen and their autom automation, um, probably more so than the Boeing airplanes, uh, and in that respect, uh, and so you have a very interesting competition. Uh, when I was young, uh, there were a lot of builders of, of airplanes, and today, of course, the market is basically closed down to uh, two, uh, and... Um, and I think we certainly wouldn't want to see it down to one. Um, but, uh, you know, it, there are, you do tend to miss what used to be in, in some of these things. 
One of the most iconic planes of the last 10 or so years is the um, uh, Airbus A380, the double-decker. Uh, again, a major composite plane. Uh, this is the largest passenger plane ever built by a fair margin and has a uh, maximum takeoff weight that exceeds 1 million pounds. It's truly an amazing airplane. Uh, unfortunately, the um, plane's scale and size has made it uh, just a little too big. A lot of airports are not willing to change their infrastructure for one plane. Uh, a lot of airlines have moved a little bit away from the hub-and-spoke system, and so these large haulers are are not doing uh, as, good, as much business as thought, even though it is truly an amazing, amazing airplane. And so some of them are being withdrawn from service, and I believe in 2021, Air Fran uh, sorry, Airbus will stop making them. Here's the cockpit of the A380. You can see the uh, uh, incredible modern uh, scale, scale of it. Uh, there are many videos on YouTube if you want to see uh, these planes in operation. Notice that in the case of the Airbus, you no longer have the center control column or stick. Uh, they Instead, they use a joystick, which they call a side stick. This is located naturally on the side, and which the pilot can use to maneuver the airplane and bring it in for a landing. This allows the center to be clear for a keyboard uh, and other types of uh, ways to interact with the uh, aircraft proper. Uh, there's been um, the Emirates, uh, Middle Eastern Airlines have been most popular customer of these. You can see they've been flying where they have even have rooms and showers on board for people who want to spend $3,000 for four hours worth of flight. Uh, these are probably business class seats here uh, in the upper deck. Uh, it's um, So there's been a chance with such a large airplane, even though it can carry over 800 people, it's generally carrying about 500 if it's full. Uh, and these multiple uh, arrangements with uh, the different types of, uh, of luxury luxury levels and service levels and so forth that are available. Uh, the Airbus 380 came to Toronto for a while. I don't know if it still is or not. Um, and uh, I haven't had a chance to see one in real. And certainly think if you are interested, you want to get to it because I don't know how much longer they'll be in the air. Moving to experimental flight again here. This is the uh, Bell X-1. Uh, this is the first airplane ever to go supersonic, and this happened in October of 1947 uh, over the Dry Lake at Rogers Dry Lake, rather, in California, uh, which is now known as Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, it was flown by a pilot of the United States Air Force who had been an ace, uh, and I believe it was 11 or 12 planes he shot down in World War II. Anyhow, he became, but he basically, I think he ended up with the five in one day. Uh, Clearly one of the finer, uh, most famous uh, stick and rudder pilots of the age. His name was Chuck Yeager. And you'll see him here standing in front of the plane. He had his uh, uh, nickname, which he had also put on his uh, <clears throat> plane in World War II. Um, and Yeager had flown many different kinds of planes. And a lot of people will say that he was a, a very fine, highly skilled uh, uh, sense uh, pilot. He had exceptional vision. Um, and um, Glamorous Glennis, well, his wife's name uh, was Glennis, and so he uh, honored her with the name on the plane. Uh, these planes were not taken off from the ground. As you'll see in an example here, they were uh, carried under the wing of, a, in this case, a B-29 uh, bomber-type plane, brought up to 20,000 feet or so and dropped like a bomb, and then after it dropped, the pilot would then ignite the engine. You see here uh, a, a different plane, but the same idea. And this is uh, uh, being uh, dropped uh, by a B-29. And then you get uh, the, uh, they'll try to light the engines. And if that works out, then the flight will occur. If it doesn't, then the pilot can simply glide to a landing. So, uh, of course, after you get to Mach 1, the next step is Mach 2. And uh, so there was a little bit of sport to, that occurred around this time. Uh, you're the lead test pilot has kind of uh, got the uh, attention of everyone. And uh, so one of the other test pilots decided that um, he had three or four, he had a flight or two left before Jaeger was going to fly again. This is Scott Crossfield. And so with a lesser plane, they decided, they talked to the engineers and they polished it and they sanded off every ribbon and they taped every seam and they came up with the most ideal a flight plan that you could think of given the technology of the day and I think the official number is they got to Mach 2.005 so they just made it well um, put it gently Mr. Yeager was not very happy and uh, 
And so he went out the next day and he broke the record and got a 2.34, but then ran into uh, an instability issue. And this is one of the problems and why test pilots uh, in such a dangerous profession, especially in those years, is that you get up into areas of, of flight characteristics where you simply didn't know. And uh, you get into things like flat spins and so forth, uh, where the uh, airplane is tumbling uncontrolled, and it's in such a the tumbling is in such a way that you can't um, um, you can't generally recover from it. Apparently, in the case of Jaeger, the tumbling was so aggressive, his head hit the canopy, and I believe he blacked out. Um, anyhow, when he woke back up again, uh, he was able to get the plane into a spin, a, a, what they call a spin, which is more easier to maneuver. Uh, position he was able to pull it out of the spin and land it um, and uh, probably most pilots uh, without Jaeger skill wouldn't have made it that day and it's a pretty dangerous business. Uh, one of the epitomes of these types of uh, test planes of that age was this one built again also by North American the X-15 and this was also dropped in this case by a B-52 and then would be lit off and would uh, go up to 60 over 60 miles um, so at the edge of space, so that actually some of the pilots of these planes got their astronaut wings uh, flying the X-15. Uh, one of the pilots of this plane flying for a civilian agency, NASA, was, of course, Neil Armstrong, one of the first men to walk on the moon. But uh, there were many others and some who lost their lives flying these. There were three of these built. And uh, so it was one of those... Um, remarkable test planes that uh, you see if you study these things. Um, back to commercial for a moment. Here we have the uh, British and uh, French combination plane, the, uh, the Concorde built in the late 1960s into the 1970s. It flew until 2003. Uh, it never really made any money, uh, but it is truly an iconic plane as I described one of my experiences of, with it um, in the previous video. And um, the uh, thing with it, if you look at it, the windows are very, very small. Um, this plane flies at 60-odd thousand feet, so the difference in pressure between the outside and the aircraft is much greater than it is for a plane uh, flying at, say, 30,000 feet. Uh, you have a two, uh, and a two and then a space and then two configuration, so you can't put too many people on board either, uh, maybe around 100 or so. I understand that uh, near the end of the seat rates for this thing were around 20,000 a seat. It uses a phenomenal amount of fuel. Um, I talked before about moving from, say, boats traveling fire for five or six days across the Atlantic to having a, um, um, a plane getting from, uh, say, New York to London in perhaps five or six hours. That change people were prepared to make. But to spend all this extra money and what have you to go to New York uh, or sorry, from New York to London in, say, three and a half hours, saving only three and a half hours, even though it cut the time in half, for many people, it just wasn't worth it. And supersonic transports just didn't make it. Here you can see the Concorde in a flight simulator video coming down for landing, and it's draw attention to some of its features. Notice how long the landing gear is so that the back end of the plane does not strike the runway. Also notice the drooping nose. Now that is a nose cover. Notice that the cockpit is still in its place but the nose droops out of the way so that the pilots can look down and see the runway. Also notice how high uh, the angle is of the airplane as it comes to set down. And this is because of the inefficiencies of the delta wing at very low speeds. And this is just the nature of the airplane. Uh, it was meant to be at 60,000 feet, not at an airport. But at least like a sports car, uh, it goes fast uh, and you're not going to save gas when you're going fast. Now here you see, um, a plane that's now retired from the United States Air Force, the F-14 Grumman Tomcat, but you can, what is reasonably important here is the wings you see there, they actually move from almost straight out to almost right back. Uh, so this variable wing type geometry uh, was designed so that the airplane uh, could change its own geometry and become more efficient at different speeds. And uh, it was very complicated, and this is a very big airplane and a very expensive airplane. Um, but it was uh, something that flew quite well for many years. They flew from the early 1970s until about 2000, and they've been since retired. Uh, and it just gives you also an example, too, of how much money uh, superpowers have to put into their air forces and recognize these planes only last 10 to 20 years before they're outmoded. This is a, a plane from the Soviet Air Force, the MiG-25. It is one of some of the biggest engines ever put on a jet plane. It travels at Mach 3. Um, 
and the Soviets basically used it in some respects to fool the United States into what this plane really was. Uh, it is a very fine, uh, it can get from A to B very quickly, um, but it is not a uh, plane that is highly maneuverable. It doesn't have the strength, the structural strength to to uh, cur turn very quickly and so forth. Uh, but that's uh, another story for another day. <clears throat> And uh, technology are coming with the idea of stealth technology where the airplanes cannot be detected by radar. Uh, this is the F-22 Raptor, the one of the first uh, planes that with that technology. And when it was being tested, they put five uh, F-15, similar to the Tomcat in the size and circumstance, uh, on their test range. And um, this plane was able to, uh, in mock combat, uh, destroy all five of those planes while well, those planes never saw it once. So, that's, and that's a pretty aggressive test. Um, and of course, when you do these at test ranges, you're dealing with some of the best pilots you've got. And these people are pretty competitive. Um, the first one really was the F-117 stealth fighter. This showed up for the first time uh, in the initial uh, Kuwait, uh, Iraq, uh, conflict of around 1990. Uh, these planes do not have any uh, guns. Uh, they simply come in in the night uh, using darkness and stealth as their protection. They come in and they leave uh, and you don't know they're there. Um, and uh, the American uh, stealth planes have really done well from the standpoint of not ever being detected or shot down. Uh, and uh, that uh, you know, that is a, it, this is a very dangerous business, of course, if you're wrong, you die type technology. Uh, probably one of the most su supreme planes in this area was this one here, the B-2 stealth bomber known as the Spirit. Uh, it is a, basically a flying wing. Um, you have to appreciate that some many of these airframes are inherently not stable and the stability issues are, are too complicated for a pilot to, to maintain. And so the plane is flown by a computer and the pilot puts inputs indicating where they want to fly. But the actual technical flying, keeping this plane stay straight and level and so on, is done by a computer. This plane can carry almost 40,000 pounds of ordnance. Uh, these, uh, they take off in the United States and they land in the United States and they're refueled in flight. And their uh, operation is generally done very secretly. Um, one of the other things that happened during the Cold War, of course, was the issue of information. And uh, the Soviet Union was very closed and did not uh, give out information with respect to its uh, military and defense and situation. So the Americans, of course, one of the advantages in any war situation is you need to be able to see the other man's cards. And uh, so they would fly over the Soviet Union uh, in this particular plane called the U-2 at very high altitudes, uh, 70 odd thousand feet or so. Uh, and then with really good cameras in the bottom, take pictures of whatever it was that they wanted to see. Now, the Soviets didn't think that this was uh, very funny, as you can understand. And uh, their technology, uh, of course, their fighter planes couldn't fly this high. Uh, but what they had done is do some excellent work on rockets and missiles. And so along came uh, this type of air defense artillery, and it shot down uh, one of the... Uh, uh, U-2s in 1960, famously known as the Gary Powers incident. And uh, that was the end of that type of plane flying in that area. Um, the, uh, it was a show trial in Moscow. It was a big deal uh, at the time. The Americans denied it originally and later on had to admit that they uh, were trying to collect uh, espionage images. Uh, U-2s were also used over uh, Cuba during the missile crisis in 1962, and I'm sure in many other situations that you'll never find out about. So after the U-2 was shot down over Soviet Union, the Americans then went and built this plane, the uh, SR-71 Blackbird. This plane travels uh, over 4,000 miles an hour and can fly as high as 100 thousand feet take pictures and they have never been intercepted uh, most of them are effectively retired because satellite technology today is superior but uh, they flew well into the 90s uh, and uh, uh, it's a truly surreal plane this is one of the only two-seater uh, of the all or two cockpit one this is the training version you can see the two cockpits there uh, a lot of these planes, if you were interested, uh, can be seen at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. If you do get a chance to, to visit that area, uh, it is a magnificent museum that will take you 
at least one, at least a couple of days of your life to go through, uh, and it's completely free. This is the HL10. Uh, one of the theories they had around that time was that if you built the right shape of a body, that the airplane's body alone would provide adequate lift, uh, and uh, all planes bodies give some lift but this is as you can see we don't have any wings of consequence here and so this was some of the technologies and they were also using this to some extent during the apollo missions when the command modules were re-entered and you use this cone shape and depending on how you set it up you can actually generate some lift with it and, and at high speeds this can help control exactly where it lands so that um, the spacecraft comes down more or less where it is intended one of the other things that really uh, aids in modern technology, of course, is the ability to refuel planes in flight. Uh, high performance aircraft uh, or a really long range aircraft uh, or these planes on long missions often run out of gas and having to land all the time is really inconvenient. So having ability to refuel planes in the air uh, has been going on now probably since the, the early 1950s originally with propeller-based planes, and then much later now with the jets. Uh, and uh, this is done. Um, there is a operator just below the boom there on board the tanker that actually um, maneuvers the boom into the fuel port on the actual fighter plane. If we look at this plane, this is one of the second largest plane uh, in the standpoint of um, cargo plane. This is uh, the C-5A Galaxy built in the 1960s. Uh, has been renovated a number of times, and uh, the um, reason it has a T-tail is because you have what we call roll-on, roll-off, so the nose will tip up, and the back gate goes down, and so you can drive on from one end and drive off the other end, which makes unloading and loading much simpler. Uh, this, uh, if you uh, look up the specifications, but I think you can put uh, two or three fully kitted out helicopters in, inside this thing. You could put tanks inside this thing. Uh, you could put a, a tremendous number of troops or, and their gear inside. It's truly amazing. Uh, here's an example of uh, the nose being lifted. Uh, notice just underneath the lifted nose, the cockpit is still there. Uh, this is the fairing below the nose. Uh, these planes uh, were, it was important to build them this way. The plane actually lowers itself. You want these low level ramps. You want to make sure that if you're landing in an area that's a bit hazardous, that you can get your gear on and off quickly and get on your way. Uh, and if you have steep ramps and the airplane stands higher, that becomes very difficult. So if you see the landing gear stands actually to the sides of the flu of a fuselage on both sides, which allows for it to, to uh, what they call kneeling, and make the plane a little bit um, lower so that to facilitate either people walking on board or, or loading of uh, equipment. Here's the Antonov uh, 225. This was originally designed to carry the Russian space shuttle, which never really uh, materialized uh, in, a, in a useful, um, like an operational way. And it's uh, a cargo plane that goes around the world uh, to air shows as well as moving stuff. Uh, and it's the world's largest cargo plane, as you can see here. An enormous wingspan, uh, double tail. Uh, and um, so this allows for... Uh, but again, there's just one of these the entire world, so it's not the same. The Galaxy, of course, there's been quite a few built over the years. Uh, V-22 Offspray, it had a very complicated development. There were some crashes. It's largely used by the United States Marine Corps. You can see it flying towards you with very large propellers. Uh, it can, and thus moving fairly quickly. But of course, these engines can rotate uh, in this manner and allow the the same plane to hover. So it's called a VTOL or vertical takeoff and landing. Um, but the development of this uh, system was uh, very complicated uh, over the years. Now there's been a long video, I know. Um, I'll finish with one image here. This is the launch day of the original 747 in 1969 in Everett, Washington. Uh, you can see on the plane uh, the decals of all the airlines that uh, helped launch it. And below you see all of the uh, cabin hostesses that uh, were part of the opening ceremony. Each one of them, in effect, christened the airplane. In those years, the flight attendants were all female. Uh, they were given fashionable uniforms. There was a great deal of uh, aspects to their appearance and how they behaved and so on. Uh, very different perhaps than we do today. Anyhow, this is a bit of history for those of you interested in the airplanes. Hopefully you found it interesting. Thank you for watching my channel.